morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll let you into a little secret. I've suddenly gained about eight inches because Jill requested that there was a box here for when she delivers the Radford so she can reach the microphone. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back for the third day of our conference. And we start off today with a really important initiative, um, and that is the post poster award for postgraduates and ECRs that is sponsored by our colleagues at the Australian um, ACDE. And this has been a very valuable and precious initiative um, by ACDE over the last three years for which um, we're very, very grateful and because it's important that our emerging researchers of the future are, are recognised for their high quality work. So to deliver the ACD post award, I'd like to ask Professor Peter Renshaw to come to the stage. Good on you. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, so the, uh, this award was introduced in 2010. Um, it's uh, ACDE sponsors it in order to support the participation and inclusion of postgraduate and early career researchers in the conference. Um, a committee was formed um, and did a thorough uh, evaluation of the posters that were on display. Uh, we looked at them in terms of the criteria, the content, the clarity and interest of the presentation, the theoretical and methodological basis and findings of the research, and finally the presentation, quality, discussion and conclusions that were drawn. So um, it's my great pleasure to announce that the winner of the ACDE, Postgraduate Early Career Research Poster Award, is Sindhu George for the poster, Self-Efficacy of Early Career Re Teachers, a Longitudinal Study. Is Sindhu here? Would the uh, Springer representative come to the stage, please? Um, I feel very, very tall right now. Um, <laughs> um, my name's uh, Nick Melchior. I'm the uh, recently appointed senior editor for education in Australia and New Zealand for Springer. And I'm very, very proud to be uh, here today to present the Springer Best Paper Award for AER in 2013. Um, what I'd like to do is ask Jill Blackmore to talk a little about why the editors selected this award, and then we'll invite the awardees to come up to the stage. My research on leadership tells me stature counts. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, okay. This uh, I'm here as the. Uh, because I've just uh, finished another term as the um, editor, managing editor of the Australian Education Researcher, and also as a member of the executive. So I'm, this is my, the last stand. Um, so the, each year Springer offers an award of uh, $500 and a trophy for the best article in the Australian Educational Researcher. The process is for the educational executive, of whom there are six of us, who have seen considerable numbers of submissions and published articles over the year to identify which is the best article for the year. The criteria uh, um, uh, is about the significance of the contribution, the theoretical framework, originality, the quality and coherence uh, and persuasion of the argument, um, the insight and, and depth of the analysis, as well as implications for policy and or practice and or theory. So on this basis, we selected for 2013 that the, that the award should go to Janelle Upton, Jan Wright and Valerie Harwood for the paper, It Felt Like I Was a Black Dot on White Paper, Examining Young Former Refugees' Experiences of Entering Australian High Schools, as in Volume 40, Issue 1. 
While there was a close contest between a number of papers, this paper stood out because of its current policy rele relevance with regard to the education of refugee students, its theoretical coherence around issues of identity, place and belonging, its contribution to what is a growing research area in Australia around refugee student experiences in and out of schooling. The title tells us much about what it is like by being black in an all-white environment and how racism is experienced as something that is embodied and whiteism is no whiteness is normalised. It indicates how inclusion and exclusion works and students develop strategies and showed agency through performance in sport, drama and music as well as academics to gain social acceptance. It is, it is interesting that in the third year that this prize has been offered and awarded, that it has again gone to an early career researcher, someone who's already just undertaking doctoral studies, but is working with um, her supervisors. Uh, and, it, and, um, and so this bodes really well for educational research and I think is indicative of the type of mentoring that we want to encourage. So on behalf of Janelle, I have to ask Jan Wright to come up and accept the award. <laughs> Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce this year the Radford Lecture. History is always important and particularly in an organisation. And the Radford Lecture was named in memory of an eminent Australian educator, um, Bill Radford, who was born in Victoria in 1913. Um, his father was a school teacher and Young Radford went on to follow in his footsteps. He entered Melbourne Teachers College in 1932, uh, where he completed a series of degrees in quick succession, um, and went on to join ACER, the Australian Council for Educational Research. After serving in the Middle East and New Guinea during World War II, he then completed a PhD at the University of London in the mid-1950s, and returned to ACER, first as Associate Director and then as Director. Um, it was Bill Radford who, in fact, moved ACER into the era of intelligence and aptitude testing um, and signed an agreement with Science Research Associations um, for the reading lab laboratories that emphasised um, a new direction in the Council's work and that were a characteristic of the experience of education of many young people in the 60s and the 70s. He also worked part-time as a lecturer at the University of Melbourne. Um, he was president and an honorary fellow of the Australian College of Education and president of AARE in 1974. Bill was actually a founding member of AARE um, and contributed to um, the executive in various different roles. In his presidential address in 1974, however, he was particularly critical of researchers for their failure to not communicate our research in practical, usable forms to those in the field of education, um, a call that's probably been reiterated several times over the decades. The Radford Lecture was established in his memory and to acknowledge Australian scholars and researchers who have an outstanding record of commitment and contribution to educational research. The 36th annual Radford Lecture will be delivered this year by Professor Jill Blackmore. Jill is Alfred Deakin Professor and holds a personal chair at Deakin University, where she's also the Director of the Centre for Educational Research, Innovations and Futures. Jill is a fellow of the Academy of Social Science, a former president of AARE, and as you've just heard, has served twice as managing editor of our journal. She sits on the editorial board of eight very prestigious international journals, 
including the British Journal of Sociology of Education, Gender and Education, the International Journal of Leadership, and the British Education Research Association Journal. Jill has a broad range of research interests and expertise that extends across all levels of education. But some consistent themes in Jill's work have been a commitment to feminist perspectives and research approaches, to equitable leadership and governance, and a concern with the implications of globalisation on educational lives and practices. Jill's held multiple ARC grants and government grants throughout her career. Um, but a strong personal characteristic of all of her work has been a deep concern and active championing of social justice. This has marked her professional contributions, but also her daily interactions and engagements. Now, despite these very impressive professional achievements, at a personal level, Jill is actually not only one of the most gregarious people that I've ever met, um, but the most generous. Um, and these attributes alone mark her out as an exceptional soul in the Academy. So I'd like you to welcome to the platform my colleague and dear friend, Jill Blackmore, to deliver the Radford Lecture. It's nice up here. <laughs> Just sort this out. Okay. Um, I would first like to um, recognise and, and acknowledge that we're um, we're now meeting on the uh, traditional lands of the Ghana people and pay respect to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, many of whom are here today, um, and also the cartoonist whose work I'm now going to happily exploit and appropriate. And I also want to thank uh, AARE for this in exceptional privilege. And I'm going to get emotional right at the start <laughs> about this, um, because it is a great honour. Okay. I either yell and scream or cry, it's one or the other. <coughs> or swear. Okay. <laughs> for those who know me. Right, <coughs> okay, so I can't even see the page. All right. How's that happened? It's really wrong. We've got to get to. No one bipped it through. Here we go. All right. I've called this the Cultural and Gender Politics in Australian Education and the Fragile Project of Educational Research. And I feel that this image is a, a wonderful, captures what I'm going to talk about because. You've got there that white, round, egg-like thing, eggheads, the fragility of the shell, the outdated book, the game of chance in getting grants with the dice and the card, that very thin platform holding it there and four very, very slender threads with a dark, looming cloud behind. Anyway, when I saw that, I had to have it, but anyway. So that is, a, 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 I think, a, captures what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Now, in keeping with the theme of this conference, uh, in terms of shaping edu Australian educational research, I'm going to practice what is often referred to in globalisation studies as methodological nationalism, largely drawing on research by Australians on Australian education and mining and exploiting the work of my colleagues. I consider how criticality in educational research is understood and the tension between being critical and being marginalised um, I examine how, I can hardly see here, up here, I examine how uh, research is positioned in the changing field of education in relation to the government, society and the economy with the rise of educapitalism globally, and I explore how the policy shifts from social democratic to neoliberal framing and the cultural and gender politics um, of the research policy problematic in Australia has, under, has occurred. And I look at three areas of policy critique, policy service and policy advocacy. I consider how the global restructuring of higher education in impact, is impacting on the nature and institutional base of educational research and then argue the case for critical educational research. Now, being critical, I've been known to be critical. Um, 
Okay. And I'm acutely... Um, sorry. So what I want to do is to actually put the, the F word and the C word back in to uh, educational research. The F word, of course, is feminism, for those who are worried. And the C word is critical, okay, for those who are also worried. So in, the da in terms of, I'm acutely aware as to the dangers of naming anything as either feminist or critical, the past three years in Australian politics has indicated how the relevance of feminism and feminist research to contemporary times, despite the gender deniers' assertions that feminism is past its use by date, rejected by Gen Y women, creates false divisions and or is largely left to raging old feminists like myself. My focus is also about being critical and feminist theorists and researchers would argue that being critical is more than just doing critique, as social change and social justice requires us to also inform policy and practice through advocacy and adv activism. Now, Nancy Fraser argued uh, in 1997, again 2003, 2013, after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, the decline of communism and the rise of past global capitalism and 9-11 and the GFC, we are now at the horizon of contemporary theorising. The post-socialist condition is characterised by first an absence of a credible overarching emancipatory project despite the proliferation of fronts of struggle, a general decoupling of the cultural politics of recognition from the social politics of redistribution, and a decentering of claims for equality in the face of aggressive marketisation and sharping rising material inequality. And she asked the question, what constitutes a critical stance in this context? And I want to ask the same question, what constitutes a critical stance in education and educational research? My colleague, Helen Gunter, says that using the critical word is being increasingly difficult in the context in education administration and policy in England, and as such, people like us are increasingly positioned as a hoodie research can, and I just love that um, image as an academic, of course. At best, I'm seen as a necessary eccentric who is listened to politely but then ignored, and at worst, my work is missing from official government websites that recommend reading for practitioners and is ho and, or harassed as dangerously feral by neoliberal knowledge workers. Being critical and doing critical work, she argues, is not new or dangerous or necessarily oppositional. It is vitally important in these new neoliberal hard times. And many of us have experienced in instance, instances when in certain tendered projects, uh, what I call policy service, uh, publications have been deleted as being too critical of policy or not relevant to practitioners. Bourdieu's theory of practice, as thankfully synthesised here by Mark Grenfell, is also one premised upon criticality. The necessity to inter interrogate categories of thought, the need to be beware of words for the way they re misrepresent the world, the preoccupation to look at the true generating processes of social systems and not to accept them in their own terms, and the idea that there must be another place to stand with regard to social phenomena, which can often be a clearer view of what exists and how. Now, as feminists, Bourdieu also considered everything is essentially political. In, which, um, in that we are seeking not just political emancipation, political emancipation, but emancipation from thinking and seeing the world in a certain way. Feminist critical policy analysis, my goodness, you can't touch that, it does it on its own. There's a living, breathing computer here. I didn't even touch anything then. Right, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Gunter and Grenfell, maybe the computer's going to take over, it's happened to me once before. Uh, Gunter and Grenfell warn that being critical often means being marginalised in terms of policy and practice. The way a critical perspective can lead to a kind of ghettoisation, which neutralises the potential for this approach to affect changes, often by creating a kind of critical meta language which isolates and marginalises the substantive insights arising from policy research in this area. So does critical mean being marginalised? Being critical doesn't necessarily mean marginality. And that's the question I now want to look at. I first want to talk about geographic marginality. Ray Wynne Connell argues in Southern Theory that Australia's cultural, geographical and economic location makes Australian educational research of national and international significance. Social thought, she says, happens in particular places. Connell refers to what is distinctive about Southern Theory, a term which indicates the centre-periphery relationship and emphasises relations of authority, exclusion and inclusion, hegemony, partnership, sponsorship, appropriation between intellectuals and institutions in the metropole and those in the world periphery. 
She also argues, further justifying the importance of building capacity in Indigenous and post-colonial educational research in Australia, that social science is at best ambiguously democratic. The dominant genres picture the world as seen by men, by capitalists, by the educated and affluent. Most important, their picture of the world is seen from the rich capital exploiting countries of Europe and North America, the global metropole. The ground knowledge of society in other experiences remains a fragile project. Now, I just want to turn this upside down, as, as Ray Wynne would appreciate, <laughs> and put Australia at the centre. Okay. Connell argues that the objectivism versus subjectivism debates in the social sciences are particularly north-centric view of the world, which excludes references of the other, particularly feminist theory, colonisation, the colonised, and leads to the erasure of history and culture. So with regard to my, I'm going to give you an example out of my area of administration and policy. For example, the major critique of the hegemony of US-centric structural functionalism and behaviour psychology emerged from the geographical periphery in Canada, Australia and New Zealand in the late 1980s. The normative centre of positivism claimed universal androcentric theories premised upon a false fact value distinction, a faith in statistics and a reified notion of the scientific method. Uh, nothing, everything recycles, doesn't it really? Um, the critique drew from Young's new sociology of knowledge around power-knowledge relations, uh, Richard Bates's work, for example, um, uh, around Habermasian critical theory and emancipatory practice in action research, the work of Stephen Chemist and Robin McTaggart, and feminist theory critiquing androcentrism of management and leadership by Jane Kenway and myself. These once critical perspectives, while not mainstreamed, have, have influenced the field significantly in both theory and practice, although usually not recognised, and is often domesticated or appropriated without recognition. Australia, Connell argues, has by the 1970s moved from, oh, isn't that wonderful, it did it by itself again. Um, Australia, as Connell argues, had by the 1970s moved from being a site of data mining by the centre with a focus on difference and the indigenous to one of a focus on similarity and mainstream society. What was it? Mainstream society. Um, I've just lost the plot here. Um, Where, where we're going, here we go. Um, in the sense of uh, being a site of data mining by the centre with a focus on difference and indigenous, to one of focusing on similarity and mainstream society as an extension of modernisation with Australian social scientists adopting all the metropolitan analytical tools and categories of class, gender and ethnicity. And for example, the use of the term SES comes straight out of you know, positivist versions of, of, of sociology in the US. Australian researchers in a settler colonising nation state read research both from the centre and the periphery. Reading from the centre means we relate to existing literature and identify how we are filling a gap in the centre. Thus, in order to be international, Australian academics read and know the American, the UK and European and Scandinavian and even Asian literatures, in English, those that are in English. And as English has become the lingua franca of academic publishing, the Australian education researcher receives numerous submissions from Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, Africa, Taiwan, China, North America, UK, Canada. Now, while some make passing reference to Australian literature, these papers use predominantly American references. The genre is premised upon a Western, North-centric mode of research and publication, mostly quantitative or mixed methods presented as a research problem, literature review, method, findings and discussion, with little mention of theory, and a rather formulaic approach that differs from what I would argue is the multiplicity of genres of Australian educational research as evident in the diversity of approaches at this conference and in the AER, where I would have hoped that the objectivist subjectivist debates have dissipated. Australian education research methodologies range from nuanced qualitative studies through to quantitative, although it signals that there is an overall trend, I think, more towards mixed methods, big databases and multiple authors. Now, Connell argues that the Austra Australia's location relative to Asia provides us with a capacity to be distinctive in our research, although what the future is around that in terms of the Asia century in current times is a bit uncertain, and as Chris Holter's report on um, the Asia literacy in the Australian teacher workforce says, um, uh, it's going to take a lot of investment of money, so I don't think it's going to go get that far. But anyway, the second level of, ma of marginality is uh, epistemic marginality. Now, epistemic marginality is necessarily critical. 
New theory often emerges from the experience of the marginalised, as in any unequal power relation. Um, the margins have to know the centre, whereas the centre can be indifferent to, even unknowing, about the margins. From the margins, feminist theorisation, for example, in my field again, have been working, about on, working on and over mainstream male-dominated social theory, which often makes universalistic claims and that fail to recognise gender, race or cultural difference. On the one hand, or that ignores or appropriates or misrepresents feminist theory and research on the other. And I've, a classic case is the feminist, uh, if you did a feminist critical analysis of the uh, current um, fetish around emotional intelligence in educational administration and, uh, and, and even in pedagogical work, um, that, that is now recognising the emotional work of leading and teaching. And if you look at that, they've derived that largely from management theory and psychology, whereas um, Mainstream theory has largely ignored what has been 50 years of feminist research around uh, that, has, has, that has challenged the false binary between emotionality and rationality and also critical and organisational post-colonial theory that illustrates how emotional economies are gendered and racialised. Instead, the therapeutic turn in the educational administration has individualised, depoliticised, neutered emotions. Ironically, emotions are no longer a feminine pathology that excluded women from leadership throughout the 20th century. In the 21st century, emotional intelligent, intelligence is a desirable leadership competency. How's that? So, emergent knowledge systems challenge dominant epistemologies and ontologies, whether feminist, post-colonial or indigenous, by promoting alternative ways of knowing, theoretically and methodologically. Building alternative knowledge bases relies on different ways of knowing and researching as theory is derived from and through experience. Early feminist research did this in terms of focusing on women's narratives, autoethnographies, um, the work of Margie Theobald, Lynn Yates has done work around this work. Indigenous knowledge claims confront normative, normative models of doing research as well. Now my colleague Glenn Ould, for example, balanced this precarious relationship between dominant and marginal epistemological approaches in his doctoral research on literacy and identity, co-producing knowledge with the Madigan people. Glenn produced multimodal narratives for different audiences to whom he felt responsible as a member of multiple relationships, his local community, his family and his academic community. His work was about cultural identity, bringing together an old tradition with a written tradition of language using digital technologies to produce talking books. I must have touched something. Motekang, <laughs> Uh, and thanks to Glenn, I know he's in the audience somewhere here. Um, but uh, that is an example of around the ways in which such research can be seen to be marginal. But in fact, what it does, um, it actually maps and creates and recognises um, what are going to become uh, um, Aboriginal languages that will, that will be lost. Glenn's research informs teaching practices in the Madigan community and the local school. He makes connections between language, place and identity. It contributes to building a knowledge base to and from the margins. Educational researchers work simultaneously, therefore, within and against and outside dominant knowledge regimes, whether it's the ER, ERA or whatever, while maintaining trust and ethical relationships with those with whom they're researching. I now want to turn to the third one, as you can already see by this computer, um, that political marginality. 
Educational research is often considered to be marginal to policy, despite education becoming increasingly politicised. The litany of complaints against educational research is that it is not presented in the style or on a scale, that means statistical studies, that is desired by policy makers, that it is not relevant to contemporary policy problems and offers complexity rather than simplicity. Loudon Brown suggested that the new sociology of education and later policy sociology had a strong tone of criticality that did not fit with the policymaker requirements, although for many of us it had a strong explanatory power in understanding how policy travels and is enacted in practice. Equally, the fragility of the research policy relationship can be attributed to the power knowledge relationships of the field of politics at particular times, where policy is informed by ideology, not evidence. Policy makers have particular agendas for which they selectively seek evidence or post hoc justification. And I want to give two examples. First of all, I'd done it. School evidence, it's beating me, right. I have to speed it up, right. <laughs> right, the school effectiveness and improvement movement. Right. Uh, the school effectiveness and improvement movement has influenced policy because it aligns with the political and methodological mindset of government, and in particular, conservative governments pushing neoliberal agendas about dismantling public education. It can be attributed to the SEI capacity to quantify and feed policy by numbers, as Bob Lingard points out, to focus on the self-managing school as a discrete unit and not as part of a wider network of relationships and responsibilities within systems and government, on leadership as a solution to the underperforming school in the 1990s and now on quality teachers as a solution to educational underachievement in the 2000s, and of course on how effective schools could be categorised so that therefore they could be treated as like schools. Now these are offered often regardless of the social and academic mix of addressing context, recognising intersections and multiplier effects between spatial injustice, poverty and, it did it for me, poverty, uh, community, lack of infrastructure and jobs, social exclusion due to race, class, gender differences and culture. This focus on the individual school and teachers readily aligns with marketisation and privatisation agendas and we see it being mobilised in charter schools in the USA and Canada, free schools in Sweden and the UK, academies um, in the UK and now independent schools in Australia. Such policies are being mobilised by global policy actors in the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, management consultancies such as KPMG and Boston Consulting, education, education, um, philanthropic organisations such as the Gates Foundation and the Clinton um, GEM, um, GEM Foundation. Yet there is no body of evidence really that links greater school autonomy, charter schools, whatever, to student learning outcomes. I now let it move on. Example two, what about the boys is the second example. Education policy has also been informed by social movements, lobby groups, church and independent school sector, unions, um, consultants and media commentators depending upon the political context. Such is the case for gender equity reform. The 2001 Federal Government Report on the Impact of Educational Research on Policy and Practice identified gender equity reform as an area where feminist research had had a quite powerful influence. Yet after 1996, the Howard Government nurtured feminist and multiculturalist backlash politics backed by the Murdoch media generated attacks um, on the history wards as well. Now, during the What About the Boys crisis of the 1990s manifested in the press and policy arenas, feminist and those educational researchers in the new sociology of, of knowledge, people like Martin Mills, and again, Bob, Bob, you're everywhere, really. Um, PISA results were misused to foreground gender rather than class and race differences by a small group of male activists and academics who focused on how feminism was to blame and position men and boys uh, as victims. This reverted to the notion of gender as a fixed and unitary category and ignored how equity policy was informed by how different masculinities and femininities are produced in wider unequal social relations of gender and power. And key reports such as that by uh, Sherry Collins, Jane Kerwain and, and uh, Julie McLeod provided evidence that the question was more about which boys and which girls, about how class, rurality and indigeneity intersect with gender in different ways. And I think the PISA results um, throughout since then have shown that is the case. At the same time, the national gender equity policy infrastructure was that had been built up over decades was dismantled after 1996, so the gender equity policy at the national level for women and girls has become largely symbolic. 
This signalled the demise of what has been actually seen internationally as a model of how to undertake gender equity policy and practice, and is, was um, informed some of the EU, European Union's mainstreaming. And then there are, of course, those who pine for the past. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm, oh, uh, sorry. This is the speechwriter's nightmare. Before I, I had to fill these in between. Right, I had to read it. These are the policy flips, OK, that go on. Abbott's Boulevard of Broken Promise. I've been trying to track it, and I keep on adding more slides. So, so uh, we know what this is about. This is about Gonski, about double flips, triple flips, and I'm sure there'll be another flip yet. Uh, I hope he doesn't injure himself too much. <laughs> and then, of course, there's those that pine for the past. And as every speech would margin knows, there's nothing worse than a minister who gets up and talks about their own experience and decides that's how everybody else should learn. So phonics, direct instruction, whatever. A bit of caning might do. <laughs> oh. Or by women, let me tell you. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. Too much. Right. I better get back to the text. Right. So, as we know, <laughs> research, policy, and politics are closely intertwined. But I will now argue that Australian education progressivism in research, policy, and practice has a strong and sustainable history of and future. This is not to be just nostalgic, but as Julie McLeod points out, to recognise that progressivism has itself its own internal contestations, inclusions and exclusions. So let's just look at a bit of the critical tradition, which part of this is my life as a teacher in the 70s, OK? And my parents, who were both educators. My mother was the first co-ed school principal in Victoria, for example, and a strong, got, got equal pay for women in the union. So, critical tradition. Innovation. Uh, during the late 1960s and early 70s, the first wave of university-based educating graduates entered the profession, informed by the new sociology of knowledge and Freirean critical pedagogy. We all had pedagogy the oppressed, illiteracy schooling beside our bedside, and education was for us more of a, in a public schools, overflowing with students, the new religion of social reform, if not revolution. I mean, it was Vietnam, anti-Vietnam time. Uh, education imparted a sense of redemptive, if not evangelical, mission. In Victoria and South Australia particularly, a general integrated project-based studies emerged. Many schools were created before technical and high schools became more comprehensive in the 80s. Innovation in curriculum and assessment was driven in most ins... Oh, what's happening? You should someone tell me if that happens, could you please? Um, innovation in... Um, this, is the, this is the presenter's nightmare, right? Innovation in the uh, in curriculum uh, occurred. Um, uh, let me see. Innovation in curriculum and assessment was driven in most instances by the teachers within a relatively benign and distant centralised bureaucracy and school leadership. Bureaucracies are not necessarily bad in themselves. Teacher activism and unionism, unconstrained by the EB, was about professional qualifications, teacher registration, curriculum and assessment. Teachers were about theorising about practice. Bill Hannon, for example, and other teachers wrote the manifesto for democratic curriculum. Academics such as Wolf Carr and Steve Chemis wrote Becoming Socially Critical. Garth Boomer and Jean Blackburn's influence was evident in South Australia and in the Victorian curriculum in forms of the Victorian Curriculum's um, Certificate of Education and in the Federal Labor School Commission in 1973 4 by the 1980s, in Victoria and South Australia, there was a strong discourse of participative decision-making in schools. The Victorian Education Department installed representatives from the parent and teachers' women's movement and multiculturalist movements inside the bureaucracy, where, and Maui Brennan can tell you a lot about that, uh, and, uh, and it was developed through a dialogue through stakeholders. EO positions were mandated in schools. Now, this critical professionalism emerged from wider social movements of multiculturalism and feminism. The strength of educational progressivism lay not only in schools or in the academy, but in a wider sense of education as an emancipatory, emancipatory project which benefits all as a public good and is central to a democratic and civil society. This became extremely evident in Victoria in the 1990s with the Purple Sage movement that emerged to oppose the neoliberal reforms in Victoria by the Kennett government. Purple Sage was a coalition of educators, public servants, students, church groups, community organisations in multiculturalism, health and welfare and teacher unions. Its research identified that local communities saw neoliberal reforms and school closures as an attack on democracy and community, particularly in the rural areas where Kennett lost government. So Australia has a distinctive 
history of curricula reform. We know from the work of Leitz, Yates and Collins and O'Connor in Australian Curriculum Dilemmas that state-based diversity of curriculum encouraged the transfer of ideas and innovation nationally. We know that national curriculum may affect this in some particular way. We know that if we did a study and repeated the study of 2001 uh, around the impact of educational research on policy and practice, if we did this now and backtracked into teacher practice, we would find New London Group's 1996 notion of multiliteracy is embedded in curriculum texts, school curriculum design and teacher practice, together with notions of productive pedagogies and rich tasks from Lute Ladwig, Lynn Reed, Hayes and Mills, that's a mouthful, Queensland School Reform Longitudinal Studies, reconciliation pedagogies from Hatton, Brennan, uh, Coma et al, turnaround pedagogies, Turnaround pedagogies from Comer and Kamler, digital literacies from Beavis, Omara, etc. These are words that teachers use, this is what teachers know. Likewise, science and maths education in many school systems has undertaken quite a paradigm shift through constructivist perspectives of Russell Tata, David Clark, Goodwin, etc. Academics continue to inform national curriculum areas of health and wellbeing in pushing areas around sexuality and seek to counter regressive moves, as does Tony Taylor, around uh, the history wars. Australian teachers, we found when we were researching international education, have a reputation internationally and are recruited because of their capacity to adapt and be innovative, which is indicative of the quality of Australian teacher education. Our next generation of researchers continue to maintain this critical edge. Now, relevant research is also being undertaken in ways that can inform policy. And I've just listed some of the reports that are just coming out in 2013, and I apologise for those I've missed alone. So there is no lack of a body of evidence in Australian research to inform policy. And as policy sociologists show, there's no linear, transparent or apolitical nexus between uh, educational research policy and praxis. Research and policy interact with complex political frames are contingent upon particular government ideologies, cultural attitudes to education, traditions and modes of governance, adherence to dominant educational discourses circulating locally and globally, the state of the national economy, etc., etc., are all factors. I want to now move to talk, and you've probably already read the next slide, so I probably hardly need to do it. Um, <laughs> fundamental shifts. <laughs> I probably won't now because it'll save time. Fundamental shifts in the ways in which this research policy nexus has changed since what you might say is an idealised version of life that I've just talked about in the 70s and 80s. Education progressivism is becoming increasingly fragile in this changing economic and political context with a shift from the social democratic framing that I talked about to a neoliberal framing of the relationship between the nation, the individual, the state and education and with the rise of what I've called educapitalism here. And as you've already read a thousand times, because we've got to this slide so often. Um, <laughs> do you want to just read it <laughs> again? <laughs> educapitalism is really about that hegemonic policy logic, and I've talked to Rob Hatton about whether I call this a doxa or a <laughs> ideology or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'll leave it at hegemony, I thought was we like, we agreed on, I think. Uh, based on gender and race neutral human capital theory and neoliberal strategies of managerialism, marketisation. And we know what they are. I've listed them there. Privatisation, individual choice. Um, stop it. <laughs> right. Educapitalism is when managerialism aligns teachers and researchers with the corporate logic of economism and entrepreneurialism. 20th century education, we know, was a state-centred project of nation building. It is now a multinational, transnational project. It is a big business and a source of income for both government and global education capitalism. And what this means is that the type of gift economy that Kenway talks about, Jane Kenway talks about, is being gradually eroded as multinationals such as um, Pearson, who is now going to control the education world very soon, um, is, uh, is now offering education packages which do everything from... Oh, God. Thank God my friends are waving down here. <laughs> education capitalism. You're going to have to do a lot of editing on this. Um, but uh, education capitalism is actually uh, undertaking. Um, we know that also that education governments is the fundament fundamental shifts between social democratic and the neoliberal policy frame. We know that governance, governance as coordination and regulation 
um, is occurring and that it is about standardised testing and professional standards rather than provision as there's a greater privatisation. We know that there's a greater seamlessness between the sectors that makes educational institutions more porous as we work in partnerships. But we also know that Australia stands out for its relative decline in real investment in education and training relative to other OECD and Asian countries, despite the discourse of knowledge economies. Australia has one of the highest levels of privatisation of costs relative to only other, the US and Mexico. Education has increasingly, as Simon Marginson talked about, a positional good rather than the collective public good. And I love this cartoon about our highly instrumentalist attitude. You've already seen the cartoon anyway. OK, there's your school. Stick your head into it. Apply yourself. Apply yourself. OK, that's enough. You're educated now. OK, there's your future. Get into it. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Lunig. OK. OK, I'm now going on. Now, Stuart McIndyre, in his book, In the Poor Relation, refers to the Australian cultural disposition towards vocationalism and an instrumentalist attitude of education, tinged by a spite anti-intellectualism even. Universities are seen to be more about, he says, preparing graduates for the profession since the 1950s rather than knowledge production, and research has really only taken off in Australian universities since the 1980s, quite seriously. In a media content analysis, Wendy Bacon in 2011 similarly comments on Australia's cynicism towards science, uh, you know, our attitude to global warming, for example, despite the scientific evidence, and she attributes it also to the concentration of media print ownership by the Murdoch, and she does an absolutely fantastic analysis of that, and I recommend you look at it. In education, Sean Wally and others have referred to mediatisation in education policy, about how the media is critical to the processes of policy production, de definition and resolution. And Australian researchers such as Joel Windle, um, Radhika Guru, um, one of my students, Janet Doolan, are researching my school and how it's been documented. And they've documented how the Murdoch press pressured for greater transparency and pressured, oh, I am on the right slide, pressured for um, the ways in which transparency equals accountability and improved outcomes, and how that was again uh, echoed in the uh, comments by politicians at the time. They've quantified how individual conservative commentators are given significant column space for opinion pieces, uh, phonics, history, gender wars, as journalism itself is, uh, investigative journalism itself is being lost and giving away to populist opinion pieces. And of course, feminism itself has always been a media matter. Debates around Julia Gillard as our first female prime minister has put gender back onto the front pages, thank God, instead of the third page girly, but not as far off. The devastating gender politics of the last three years revitalised feminist activism, as you know from the proliferation of work that's come out now by people like Anne Summers and Jane Caro, to counter the undue attention paid to the conveyors of anti-feminist masculine anxiety and deep-seated misogyny of Oz shock jocks and cartoonists, encouraged by conservative political leaders who, through their own discourses, make such discourses allowable for other people and the anonymity and the toxi toxicity, I can't even say it, of the social media. Reverberating messages are sent and received to the next generation of women leaders and girls about what happens to women in positions of power and leadership, and Jane Wilkinson's done some of that work. Discourses of gender in are inextricably just tied up with nationalism, citizenship and identity, particularly around leadership with all its symbolism. The problem lies not with the failure of feminism, the refusal of hegemonic blue-tied masculinities, to accommodate any change in the social relations of gender that reduces male advantage in the workplace or politics. Finally, education has become a site and destabilised as a site of national and, and uh, destabilised national and cultural identity and economic volatility, as Raymond Williams talks about the structures of feeling, best described as I have as one of generalised anxiety. And market values of competitive individualism fuel rights-based claims based on individual choice rather than needs-based claims based on collective interest. And I've, I go on to argue there about how uh, conservative discourses could readily capture the, the, the parental anxiety to make it into um, a, a participation and misused it uh, in terms of neoliberal aims. Okay, so what are the implications of all of this? I now want to go on and talk about what it means for both schools, about the, this policy research nexus and this changing context, and then I'll talk about us as academic and educational researchers. First of all, how policy shifts and frames practice. 
We know that policy is also adopted, adapted and ignored in schools and classrooms as teachers negotiate the complexity of managing multiple and diverse student aspirations and needs. While working within multiple, often contradictory policy frames, some more enabling than others. Now, I'm going back to Victoria because this is the one I've done most research on. But in Victoria, the 2001 Connors Review of Public Education and the Kirby Review of Post Compulsory Education found that the notion of a public system in Victoria had been lost. Devolution in the in, had, during the 1990s set up schools in competition with each other, required strong external accountability and school autonomy. It meant that teachers and leaders did more with less. But structural reform had not, and the architect of this reform, uh, Brian Corwell, himself admitted this in 2003, as did the minister, that structural reform did actually not improve learning outcomes. PISA results also, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but also the Vincent reports, Teese, Policel and Lamb's research show clearly that Australia has significant areas of locational disadvantage. Educational underachievement coincides with severe underemployment, poor health and wellbeing, inadequate community infrastructure, lack of jobs and other things that come out of that. Indeed, the increased polarity between rich and poor students, schools and communities is symptomatic of more devolved systems of schooling generally in the Anglo uh, uh, states, USA, U uh, Australia, UK, New Zealand, but also Sweden and Mexico. But to restore, in order to restore a public sense of a public system, the Victorian Labor government developed one suite of policies focusing on schools working on clusters, local learning and employment networks to support students of at risk of dropping out as they transitioned from school into work and further education, new curriculum initiatives such as the Victorian Certificate of Applied Learning, on track data, and I have to thank Jack Keating, the late Jack Keating, for the work he's done on this. A second suite of policies also intensified focus to focus on stronger accountability of underperforming schools on literacy and numeracy, again in response to the national agendas of my school and that plan, but also because it was very much within a school effectiveness framework as well. Thirdly, there was another suite of policies also framed by the school effectiveness called the blueprint. And this invested significantly in leadership capacity building, but also research by leaders and teachers in schools, on school and school-based research activities, on professional learning and leadership framework that was developed through consultation with academics and principals, and they also invested in new buildings and infrastructure. Now, seeking, <laughs> here we go, seeking to understand the impact between the connections between the built environment and student learning, I and my Deakin colleagues, and I know Anne, um, Anne Clunan and, and Joe Amari here, uh, undertook a D, uh, Department of Education and OECD learning uh, um, study on in innovative learning environments. Now, in this particular study of 12 case studies, we found that a key enabling policy conducive to innovation was the Leading Schools Fund. Now, what this fund did was that it required schools within a locality to examine the provision of schooling. It linked new buildings to pedagogical purpose. Principals and schools were encouraged to think big and to plan. Multiple reconfigurations of schooling emerged out of incredibly difficult amalgamation processes and prolonged ones. K-12 schools, multi-campus schools, university school partnerships, annexes for kids at risk. Some innovative learning environments were pragmatic, others whole of school. Some schools were part of neighbourhood renewal programs and a wider community capacity building, building strategy and policy. All involved in some way redesigning either the entire or some part of their built learning environment. And here's an example of a, a rural school and a city school. Um, so you can see the differences. I can give you a guess which one it is. Okay. Now, in this particular project, I want to talk about your Park Second Community College. This is a school that we all cried virtually when we went into it in this study. Your Park is located in Wendouri West. It's a highly disadvantaged region in Ballarat. It's part of the Wendouri West Community Learning Hub which includes education, health and community facilities in one location arising out of a neighbourhood renewal program. The hub hosts children's services, providing occasional care. It's got a clinic, a dental clinic, it's got a maternal health services, a youth centre. The school is listed in the government school's performance summary as having 78% of its students in the bottom uh, middle and 16% in the lowest Ixia percentile. Your park emerged from a complex and long amalgamation opposed by many parents from two primary schools. 
It developed through long and intensive consulta consultation. I was right. Uh, consultation uh, to redesign every aspect, right through from the buildings to the school operations and curriculum. As with the other IL case studies that we undertook, the participatory re redesign process was dependent on teachers agreeing that something significantly different had to happen to make a difference, and so there was a high commitment to renewal. The principal positioned himself as the centre of the team within a flat leadership structure, premised on shared decision making, team teaching and planning with the community. More deliberative democracy, I would argue, than distributive leadership, which I think is often about delegating risk and responsibility without the resources. The three specifically open space design multi-age learning pods facilitated this leadership approach. And if you look at the diagram there, you can see them at the back of the school, the community college and all the hall there at the front. The planning, design, building, transitioning and implementation took over seven years. Current staff did not expect to see incredible improvement in learning outcomes. They ignored NAP plan. They used NAP plan to inform their work, but they largely ignore it. They focus on the needs of each group of students as it progresses through against their own advancement. So, what are the type of lessons for reform that one could get out of this particular, out of our 12 case studies we did? Well, community consultation and generative redesign of space provided new opportunities for these teachers and leaders to create new partnerships and imagine new pedagogical possibilities. System-wide and whole school investment in professional learning were critical because we know that changing teacher practices and supporting them precede changes in, in any things around student learning, whether it's uh, cognitive or non-cognitive. Regional import was essential. They provided literacy and numeracy coaches and leadership support. Success was measured in terms of community responses with increased voluntarism and engagement, quite evident with the, within the school. Uh, the teachers, who, the parents who opposed it are now at the front desk, are voluntarily at the front desk of this school every day of the week. Community pride in this school is quite evident um, and it's obvious that the investment in this built environment had significant benefits, although people in the community actually said this community did not deserve this school. That's what other, other schools said, some other people at some other school. The community felt valued because of their needs and interests were recognised and therefore they reciprocated. The school provided a place of sense and belonging as a social centre of community. This is actually about community capacity building in a civil society. It adds to what we have now. It, it is about the policy issue. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. We have a body of evidence in Australia now that actually adds to that. We know that systemic support is critical for all schools, but that some schools need more, ju more due to location disadvantage. That Gonski cannot be done is, is absolutely incredible, that, that this is what Gonski has to do. That's the first point. And we have to actually try to do something collectively about that, because they haven't really changed that much. Best practices are not transferable and like schools do not exist because context matters more. Internal accountability through peer review and systematic inquiries, more Susan Grant Water Smith can tell us about this, is more likely to improve outcomes and strong external accountability. The teachers and principals use multiple forms of evidence and definitions of success. That leadership is important in supporting teachers, allocating resources, encouraging risk taking innovation, focusing on learning. That resilient students rely on students as social centres within wider networks of interagency collaboration to support them and their families. We know that uh, place and sense of a belonging matters, the work of Margaret Summerville, for example, often precedes learning, that is place-based education. We know that quality schooling infrastructure can make a difference in terms of health and wellbeing as well as in terms of long-term educational outcomes and that the reform and evidence of improved outcomes takes time. This is going to be a 10, 12 year project in this school. The policy issue, of course, is not about scaling up or the bottom line of efficiency or effectiveness. In the short term, it is about building local capacity for schools to undertake this type of sustainable reform. It's about mutual accountability between schools and systems, and that is government. Okay. But we know that also, within the globalised context, that schools live in a reform reform churn. Education is now located within a political environment in which education systems are compared and not just schools, but for which individual schools are held accountable. The PISA results that have just come out, we know now that it's a gap 
between the what I mean, Bob Lingard's written about and others have written about this already in the um, in the conversation. But we know, even though we, we seem to be high equity, we know it's the gap between the top group and the bottom group that it's it's large. It's two and a half years difference uh, right across literacy and numeracy, um, and that that is what the issue is. It's not the issue about how we compare with other countries because we know, as comparison, PISA results are highly questionable, um, and so. In a sense, that is the argument that we have to make and has already been made today in the conversation. But new governments sweep clean websites and eradicate knowledge bases built up over time by teachers and researchers. Too often governments practice policy amnesia, that is nothing good happened before us, or redirect policy funds away from research, um, that is uh, to evaluation. Once again, there's a policy shift back to independent schools, greater school autonomy, with moves away from system and regional support. They've already got rid of the uh, literacy and numeracy coaches. They've already got rid of the regional le learning network leaders. So one way of reform just heaps upon another before any evaluation is undertaken, even at the, pro the previous reform. So what does this mean for us as educational researchers? So I'm going to finish. I don't know how far I've got. I'm ignoring the time. What, what does this mean for us? Well, educational researchers, we're also told, and we're also in reform churn. We are living in a moment in which our institutional base is also under challenge, just like it is for teachers. Mary, I'm sorry I didn't see you there. I apologise for not mentioning you. Mary Dixon. Um, educational researchers also work in a rapidly changing policy mix. It changes university school partnerships. We know that the National Partnerships Program and Higher Education Participation Program, they're going to be going. They have actually nurtured some really fantastic university school partnerships and enriched those types of partnerships on the ground. We know that the institutional base uh, the institutional base and the nature of the field of educational research is also being radically transformed, contingent on the changing and highly ambiguous role of what a university is in the 21st century. Self-interested management experts, Ernst and Young, and I put Pearson here, but actually that's Barber, but he works for Pearson when he wrote that report. So I put Pearson as a slide, anyway. And, uh, and others have argued that we have to move towards educapitalism if we're going to survive as universities. The reform churn in universities is such that the rules of the game have changed. We know that universities themselves are confronted with the privatisation of educational research, with the rising influence of consultancies and think tanks such as the Grattan Institute and the IPA. We know that the university is not the only site where research is undertaken, except the others do not have the same ethical constraints that we do. We know that universities have become transnational corporations with multiple campuses, partnerships, joint courses, collaborative research, on and offshore campuses. We know that this is challenges and opportunities for us all as researchers. But this constant reform churn also, and uncertainty, also impacts on what we do and how we do research, and also how our research is valued, even within the academy, least of all outside by policymakers. In the current ARC discovery on leadership in the entrepreneurial university, we are finding that academics are stressed, overworked, overwhelmed and feeling undervalued. No response, that's good. <laughs> Obviously we've got the wrong cohort. <laughs> Massification and internationalisation have put greater demands on teaching. Uh, external accountabilities on, such as Eurotex and AQF are now driving the internal logics through processes of standardisation of research and teaching. New management technologies uh, download the administrative work and responsibility for outcomes onto individual academics. Constant upskilling is required for blended learning and now, of course, the wonderful fetish for MOOCs. Such pressure, pressures distract from the core work of teaching and research and undertaking public service. And if you look here at the diagram here, you can see the rate of students to the dotted line. The dark line is, no, it's not academics, that's the administrative, that's the non-academics in universities. I just thought I'd point that out. So a number of disturbing trends are occurring from social science and educational research. Oh, <laughs> stop it. Right, okay. First of all, for academics, what first of all, there is a greater, I have I've got the right one now. No, no, what have I got? So I'm sorry about this. For academics, so I've, I've done that, yes, I'm sorry, I'm totally confused. Right, disturbing trends, differentiation. First, there's greater differentiation between research intensive research and teaching and intensive universities due to the 
uh, move towards instit institutional compacts, branding and specialisation. Universities now seek new sources of incoming technology and obviously they look to the sciences, material, biological, material and medical sciences more than humanities and social sciences. ARC funds are also skewing to applied industry, not government partnerships, and you only have to look at the latest IRCs. They're very implied, uh, applied, even though there is like in discovery applications. The AAR report, Living in the 2.2 World, indicated a shift also of education research towards the research-intensive institutions. This not only disadvantages the humanities and social sciences, but the smaller regional universities, but also threatens the notion of the liberal comprehensive universities. So whether we're going to be tracked <laughs> Yes. I'll leave it up to you to vote. I'll ask for a vote at the end where you're going to want to be, right? Okay. Now. But what it does is it actually threatens the notion of the liberal comp and that's tan uh, of course that's horror chick. She's just wonderful. I love her. But anyway, McIntyre argues in the poor relation about the fragility, and he uses the same word, of the social sciences. The notion of the liberal university in which the social sciences and humanities played a key role has never been as strong in Australia. Denied the academic standing enjoyed by scientists as real research is done in laboratories by experiment and discovery rather than through the interpretation of social practices. This cultural disposition is intensified with the driving force of economism as the market, the economy and the state have been brought into tight alignment. There is a simple equation of equation with science and technology in the public media and research policy. This is the ARC front page. And if you go through, I counted uh, so many pieces of equipment, <laughs> so, so many flasks, so many animals, so many men and so many white coats. It was phenomenal. And the only time they talked about education or did anything in social science and humanities was about technology. Okay, say no more. Right, disturbing trends. Secondly, unbundling of academic work. We know that ERA and Enterprise Bargain is encouraging this underbundling of academic work into research only and teaching only, both increasingly casualised. While the core work of teaching and research, while relatively more secure and more, we still have more teaching and research in education than we put out. 2.2 report showed. But at the same time, there is an emerging new third space around people who are instructional designers, research managers, et cetera, et cetera. And many of our doctoral students are going into that space, I have to tell you, because they're looking at academics and going, don't want to do that. Okay. But what we do know from this very quick slide that just came up, um, that <laughs> we are in a feminised and casualised occupation. And as you can see here, that there's a greater feminisation, although at the top, even though there's more women above SL, there's still not that many women as full professors, and they're largely located in the humanities and the social sciences, which are areas that, which are more under threat in current funding regimes. Okay. Now, third, executive power is expanding rapidly and being increasingly wielded to better... Okay. Executive power is being expanding rapidly and being increasingly wielded to better manage research to align with institutional and national priorities. The power, and I have to say the salaries, of executives and VCs have radically increased in an inverse relationship to the power of academic boards, as my uh, colleague Julie Rowlands has shown. As each new VC undertakes painful and expensive restructuring, rebranding and badging, and I've been rebranded I think about six times in 25 years now, um, the trend is for large executive faculties with only few faculties of education. I won't put up my hands about people who are left in faculties of education in this room. While making it easier for executive management, it reduces the diversity and discipline of disciplinary voices at the executive level. And a study by Scott et al. cited here in 2011 showed that those in the executive level are largely white, they're largely male, they come from the, the sciences, the hard sciences. Uh, we've got a few education people in there. But what we also know, and we've just tried to track this in our study, that the DVCs research are largely white, male, but they're also large, and those that are female, even those that are female, are all out of the sciences, psychological sciences, et cetera, and very few out of the humanities. Thus, research leadership is characterised by a lack of epistemological and methodological diversity, as well as gender and ethnicity, which impacts on the types of institutional discourses about what counts as valued research. So you're wondering why women are leaving university, right? Okay. 
Any restructuring that goes, undergoes is always gendered because every institution is gendered in the ways in which it organises its time and space and resources. While women are the majority, of course, as students and academics, numerous reports now indicate that there's more conflict than balance between family and work, with labour, that's right, that is right, it actually did it for me, with labour um, intensification and time consuming flexibility of technology. Flexibility and mobility are increasingly key attributes of being a successful academic and a precondition for academic and managerial executive level leadership. This favours, of course, men who are less connected to the routines. I'm not saying they're not, not connected to family, I'm just saying they're less connected to the routines of family and household. And women are more likely to stay in casual positions, have less mobility and more likely to follow their partners. Escalating expectations for quality research and teaching means that early career researchers are in a situation they might have to make choices in that unbundling process between what types of, whether they do teaching only, teaching only research. And, and I've already made a comment about the move towards the sciences. All right. Female academics in a study by Fatera showed that in fact, as you can see, 2010, look at what's happened after 2010 in the research intensive universities, the numbers of women, quite interesting in the tenured positions, not in the, not in the casual but in the tenured. So that's an interesting point about what's happening with ERA as a consequence of ERA. Finally, education, I'll try and just finish th this bit quickly so I can finish. Oh yes, there's that one, of course. That actually happened to me once, but anyway. <laughs> actually, I left it in the shop where I bought my clothes. I left my son, but anyway, when he was three months old. Anyway, so right, finally, <laughs> no, no, he's three weeks old, sorry. Um, in a little round thing. Yes, right. <laughs> right. Finally, education, interdisciplinarity. We now know that education, there's debates about whether education is a discipline, whether it's a field, okay? And we do know, though, from the, the report that was undertaken last year, that it is a multidisciplinary field with a wide and tenuous institutional base. I've already talked about the institutional base, that the social sciences are more vulnerable to being restructured, et cetera. Um, there's a discussion going on in the UK that, is that the Anglo-American enactment of the field is that the idea of education as a separate academic discipline does not have its own forms of theorising as say the Europeans, where there's a strong difference sets of uh, national cultures around, dis around the notion of disciplinary bases in, in the European context, and Martin Lorne has done a lot of work on that. Furlon and Lorne, though, argue in the UK context that the education research is much weaker because it's more policy sensitive, informed by external interests, a community of scholars, based on sociality and pragmatism under pressure, a practical turn, with the teacher training agency, evidence-based practice with systematic reviews, the equation of education faculties with teacher education and the structural demise of faculties due to research assessment. Now, you could say that all of these things are evident in Australia. You could look at all of those points and say, yes, we see that as well. We are policy sensitive and we do policy service. And that's, why we, that's how we're policy sensitive. We are informed by external interests, and I've mapped out what that is. My question was, are we just a community of scholars based on sociality and pragmatism under pressure? I'd question that one in Australian context. Um, Evidence-based practice, we don't have systematic reviews, we don't have that faith in that type of science. Thank God that type of cynicism of science might save us. Um, although we do have the science of learning now. Neuroscience, technology, psychology, with one little section on pedagogy in the new centre that's being funded. No mention of context, policy, administration. Interesting. And we've got the equation of education faculties with teacher education. That happens even by our own deans. And the structural demise of faculties due to research assessment. I've just track that out. My question is, to what extent does that characterise us, or if it does, what are we going to do about it? Okay. So I'm arguing that we actually have a bit of a, of a, a potential. We really have to try and broaden our understandings of what constitutes educational research. We know it's a broad field. 
um, whether we, we, I think we have to really recognise that we're doing lots of research across a whole lot of different places other than teacher education and that came out in the report. In the 2.2 report it was higher education and teacher education were the two main areas that were named. But there's a whole lot of other areas in which we, the VET sector, a lot of people do adult and community education, workplace stuff. I think we have to make that case and in fact that might be our saviour, particularly if they push uh, teacher education more and more back into schools. But at the same time, I would also argue that it's our strength in working with schools, in partnerships with schools, on long-term relationships, that that is going to save us from that, what's happening in the UK. And I think that is where we really have to maintain a very strong case. And with research that's being done by Di Mayo and all her team around what happens in terms of longitudinal studies about the impact of, um, of what happens. And Jenny Gorst, another terrific researcher on this, and Ladwick and others. I mean, we really have to take that type of research and, and point out how we do have really high quality teacher education. Go away, stop it. Um, and then I think we need to say that we need to protect the diversity and theoretical and methodological strengths we have in educational research uh, against going back to what I talked about before, about hard data, division, you know, like that takes me back 30 years. We really have to say, uh, that we have strengths in this type of diversity in what we offer in our field. We have to work with the trend towards big data and try and nurture, and that's what this is all about, nurture our next generation of academics. And I think we are doing a pretty good job of it. RRE is trying to work really hard on this because they have got a very different career path, although not quite as different perhaps when we talked about our own career paths as we thought, but I think they're in a very different context uh, coming through and how critical that is for that to be maintained. So, I'm arguing the case for purposeful educational research. In the 2.2 world thing, what, what, the, what we were told was that people are in educational research because they want to advance knowledge, they wanted personal intellectual stimulation, it's probably the second one that probably keeps a lot of us in here, <coughs> and the third one making a difference for practitioners. <coughs> and Connell argues we need to try and think in particular around how we might serve more democratic purposes in education. I want to argue the case for policy advocacy and activism and argue that when you do policy, we need to do policy advocacy as well as policy service and policy critique. I'm getting the, the nod. Retain the value of research and the gift culture of collegiality. Internally, it means in terms of research capacity building of the next generation, what I've already talked about. It actually means reciprocity and trying to retain the gift culture within our, by actually reciprocating by, if you get published in a, in a journal, you should perhaps do some reviewing for the journal. Working with and through civil society, our local communities of practice and partnerships with schools. To recognise the power of the vernacular and consider what notions of Southern theory may mean in the context of our nascent relations. To think about what constitutes the international as something that is perhaps more culturally specific. And more, to work with and on the media, as uh, just has happened this morning already in the conversation, to re-educate journalists as to what research tells them, or us to talk back to the media through the social media, through the conversation. We have edu edu research Matters. If you go into the RRE website, you will find that there. People who have got really annoyed that they've got some research that disproves what's in the media, please email to Nicole Moller or Mockler or myself and um, we'll get you to write a little piece on that. Persuade through research, recognise that there are different perspectives and being explained to the various Stakeholders and people in research are being critical actually explains the dissonance between why policy does not achieve its outcomes. Make claims about universal rights and equality and social justice, as Nancy Fraser would say, while recognising there's not necessarily universal ways of seeing the world. And, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> I was thinking when I put this in, it was, might be a long haul, but just uh, this is a few weeks ago. Um, I actually think we might only have, instead of a long marathon, a rather short 100 metre dash. <laughs> anyway, just reading the last bit. When universities and academics lose that sense of obligation to and from the public, for the public and the commitment to ethical and rigorous research, we have lost the only thing that distinguishes universities from any other educational provider and academics from market researchers. We need to confront the danger that education research may be reduced to method while we're working to retain the, knowledge, the notion of education research as a mandatory, mandatory praxis. Thank you, Lunik.
Jill. I think the, um, the length of that applause says it all. As, as always, you took us through a, a broad theoretical terrain, provoked, seduced with those wonderful visuals, and challenged us to, um, to maintain the revolution. We do have some time left for questions, and we have some roving mics, so feel free to be as provocative as Jill was in that address. <laughs> questions, comments? Clearly you persuaded no. them all. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Um, just a, a broad question. You started um, by talking about your personal thanks, um, uh, history as an educator and, and identifying as a feminist. And I'm wondering, do you think that um, your identification as a feminist researcher has changed now than uh, when you started? Um, and how would you respond to that given the current kind of climate? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think it's changed at all. Um, I mean, feminists know that there's no progressivist general improvement in things like this, and it's a bit like that up and down bump that, you know, we know that there are moments when things w work and you can have an impact, and, um, but my, my basic uh, principles around social justice and equity have never changed, and I think, I think that's, um, I think that's where you have to decide on yourselves about where you want to take a position and take that stance and, uh, and how you maintain that as a basic principle. And I'm working through a current book around Nancy Fraser and her principles of social justice, and it's actually on next. Um, not that I want all, all of you there. But um, yeah, it, it's around trying to work through how her principles of social justice might inform my field of educational administration and leadership. And I think um, I've always struggled to think about what how, how, how we, I think about what it means in terms of practice and also how to inform policy when you can. Radhika. Radhika, hi. No, I can't see anything. It's very blinding up here, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, sorry. I was wondering, Jill, thank you. That was a great lecture. As well, we've talked about the importance of context earlier. Yep. And I was wondering, Depend, uh, given that the context within Australia has changed, or even globally has changed uh, over the last, say, 20 years or so, a couple of decades, how has education research in Australia kind of changed with the context? Or what does it have to do uh, to be able to, um, to use the current jargon, be more uh, effective in the current context? What does it need to do differently um, between what it did before and now? Yeah. Um well, it depends on who the we is. I mean, um, as individuals, I'd argue... Um, I mean, I think we've got to, as a, as a community, we've got to, as I've argued already, um, try to build research capacity for the next generation um, and to, to try and uh, bring them into research. And I, th I think that's where we can use the notion of big data, uh, big, big projects, big data, because that's where, that's where the, it's really changed quite significantly in terms of funding. So we can use that to bring people into research projects and, and, um, and to try and build that type of data. But I think we're going to have to look outside the ARC because I think increasingly um, that's a, a bit of a problematic space at the moment. And, um, and, uh, and I think that we need to start to look more out into um, what, what the context is now, as everybody is, is looking more out to NGOs and, and other businesses and everything else to try and find partners to work and do research. But that is going to require a lot more persuasion on our part, I think. We have to learn to persuade people. It's going back to that point, persuade people that they really want to make a difference, um, that they actually have to... Um, that we, they actually have to recognise it does involve stuff they don't want to hear sometimes as much as stuff that they do want to hear, uh, and that um, and they have to support research from what the evidence says rather than, you know, in that sense, uh, and that research is not always conclusive too. That's the other side to it. Um, I think it's, I think what is the worry now is that, um, and, I, and, and I think what worried me just yesterday was, was hearing the discourse about the fact that something like, 
This is happening in the UK. Teacher education is going into that, so therefore we have to do it to ourselves before someone does it to us. You know, um, that's a discourse that's what well, that has mobilised a lot of what's happened in universities, say under the uh, the research assessment practices. I mean, I wrote a paper about how um, anticipating policy, how in fact um, how in fact policy. In fact, the universities and academics did it to ourselves before even we had a research assessment. We were just going through the trials and already they were taking on all the worst practices, making lists of journals and all those types of things. I think we have to fight on multiple fronts. I think the AARE is aware, very conscious as an organisation that they have to really um, work on a number of ways. I think, as I said, using the media as much as possible. We have to talk back to media. We seriously, we have to educate the journalists which is the point I've already made with you <laughs> last night. <laughs> yes. Um, that leads into the question that I wanted to ask. Um, you say that we have to work with the media, but how do we make sure that our genuine engagement with the community doesn't get subverted into just being a photo opportunity that's taken up by perhaps the university's public relations department? How would you kind of advise us about that? Uh, I think you have to do it as well. Uh, Although, what, and I actually missed out on the whole paragraph because I was being told to shut up. I had a particular paragraph uh, but, uh, here near the end. It was something about, if I'm allowed to look at it, if I can get through all my references, because I've referenced everyone in Australia. I have to tell you, my reference list. <laughs> You're all here. Look, eight pages down, nine, <laughs> ten. On every, they, by the way, they won't publish me in AR because I'm not international enough. <laughs> it's interesting. I've argued here in a way that, um, that in a way we have to be aware and vigilant as to how one is positioned and, and embedded in those types of relationships in the policy game. And I also say we've got to be aware of academic corporatisation and the meeting of organisational performance indicators so that they can easily undermine the very projects that we're there and concerned about so that the indicator itself does not become our purpose. That is, we become more concerned about being good than doing good. And I think we actually have to be constantly alert to that. I think you can do both, but I think you have got to make some decisions about it. You've just got to learn to take some nuanced decisions about it. I don't think you totally reject it, because that is the environment in which we're living in. And, but, and, but I don't think we want to become the totally performative subject that is subject to everything else that, that everyone's telling us. As the, um, as the final stage of the Radford Lecture, I'd like to invite our president, Professor Julianne Moss, to come to the stage and deliver the award. All the five foot threes get very <laughs> <Taller. Enough time. laughs> That's right. Um, um, as, as president of, of IRE, one of the questions that people often say to you, it's a lot of work, <laughs> um, but I guess that the thing for me is, that yes, I'm continually running out of um, email space, um, but I guess uh, what I'd like to do is, is to offer something that's um, counter that, which means that you get a lot to work alongside and be in dialogue with our re research community, but also those who have led and shaped Australian research. And Jill Blackmore, as the presenter of the 2013 Radford Lecture, has given us a strong sense of what indeed has shaped educational research, but also what is required of us as a research community in these contradictory times. On behalf of the Australian research community through AARE, I'd like to present you with your award certificate and a small gift in appreciation of your s incredible contribution to shaping educational research in Australia.